Okay. I'm going to try reading and I wanted to give you guys a different view than me just saying stagnant on my chair. So, and if we're walking through the woods, so I figured it would be appropriate. Hopefully this actually works. Um, the next chapter, I'm sorry, you're going to hear me breathing because, you know, like, duh, I am walking. Um, so the next chapter is really short, but the chapter after that is really, really long, really long. So I'll do the whole next chapter and start the chapter after that. Uh, that's the plan anyways. I don't know. I may just do a short chapter. Whatever. We'll see. <sighs> hopefully, hopefully this works. <sighs> Luckily, I know this area like the back of my hand. Yeah, so <laughs> reading and walking at the same time is probably a dumb idea. Um, but we'll see. Especially through here. <laughs> Especially through here, there's a lot of rocks. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna just stay over here for a little bit. Because it's nice. I get this story started. And then we'll do some, oof, then we'll do some walking. As I trip. <laughs> I haven't even started reading yet. I'm not going to go all the way up, up. There. Okay. She yelled for perhaps 15 minutes sometimes cupping her hands around her mouth and turning her voice in the direction she imagined the main trail must be, mostly just standing there by the ferns and screaming. She gave one final shriek, no words, just a high bird call of combined anger and fear, so loud it hurt her throat, then sat down beside her pack and put her face in her hands and cried. She cried hard for maybe five minutes, it was impossible to tell for sure. Her watch was back home, lying on the table next to her bed. Another smooth move by the great Trisha. And when she stopped, she felt a little better, except for the bugs. The bugs were everywhere, crawling and whining and buzzing, trying to drink her blood and sip her sweat. The bugs were driving her crazy. Trisha got to her feet again, waving the air with her red socks cap, reminding herself not to slap, knowing she would slap, and soon, if things didn't change, she wouldn't be able to help herself. Walk or stay where she was? She didn't know which would be best. She was now too frightened for anything much like rational thought. Her feet decided for her, and Trisha got moving again, looking around fearfully as she went wiping her swollen eyes with her arm. The second time she raised the arm to her face, she, she saw half a dozen mosquitoes on it and slapped at them blindly, killing three. Two had been full of bursting. The sight of her own blood didn't ordinarily upset her, but this time all the strength went out of her legs, and she sat down again on the needle carpet in a cluster of old pines and cried some more. She felt headachy and, and a little whoopsie in her stomach. But I was just in the van a little while ago, she thought over and over. Just in the van, the back seat of the van, listening to them snipe at each other. And then she thought of her brother's angry voice drifting through the trees. Don't know why we have to pay for what you guys did wrong. It occurred to her that those might be the last words she would ever hear Pete say. And she actually shuddered at the idea. 
as at the sight of some monstrous shape in the shadows. Her tears dried up more quickly this time, and the weeping wasn't so intense. When she got to her feet again, waving her cap round her head, almost without realizing it, she felt halfway to being calm. By now they'd surely know she was gone. Mom's first thought would be that Trisha had gotten pissed at them for arguing and gone back to the caravan. They'd call out for her, then retrace their steps, asking people they met on the trail if they'd seen a girl in a Red Sox cap. She's nine, but tall for, it, for her age, and looks older, Trisha could hear her mom saying. And when they got back to the parking area and found she wasn't in the van, they'd start getting seriously worried. Mom would be frightened. The thought of her fright made Trisha feel guilty as well as afraid. There was going to be a fuss, maybe a big one involving the game wardens, and the Forest Service, it was all her fault. She had left the path. This added a new layer of anxiety to her already disturbed mind, until she began to walk fast, hoping to get back to the main trail before all those calls could be made, before she could turn into what her mother called a public spectacle. She walked without taking her previous meticulous care and moving from point to point in a straight line, turning more and more to the west without realizing it. Sorry, it's going to be kind of stunted. Turning away from the Appalachian Trail and most of its subsidiary, sub, whatever, <laughs> subsidiary paths and trails, turning in a direction where there was little but deep second growth woods choked with underbrush, tangled ravines, and ever more difficult terrain. She alternately called and listened, listened and called. She would have been stunned to learn that her mother and brother were still locked in their argument and did not know even yet that Trisha was missing. That's pretty sad. She walked faster and faster, waving at the swirling clouds of minges, no longer bothering to skirt clumps of bushes, but simply plowing straight through them. She listened and called, called and listened. Except she wasn't listening, not really, not anymore. She didn't feel the mosquitoes that were clustered on the back of her neck. <sighs> He's got to stop, and stop every few feet to sniff which works for my purpose. <sighs> Lined up just below her hairline like drinkers at happy hour, guzzling their fill. She didn't feel the no seams caught and wriggling in the faint, sticky lines where her tears were still drying. Her giving way to panic wasn't sudden, as it had been at the feel of the snake, but weirdly gradual, a drawing in from the world, a shutting down of outer awareness. I suppose I could just walk and then do a voiceover later, but what's the fun in that? Then it's not as atmospheric. She walked faster without minding her way, called for help without hearing her, her own voice, listened with ears that might not have heard a returning shout from behind the nearest tree. When she began to run, she did it without realizing. Have to be calm, she thought as her sneaker feet sped past the point of jogging. I was just in the van, she thought as the run became a sprint. I don't know why we should pay for what you guys did wrong, she thought. Ducking, barely a jutting branch that seemed to thrust itself out one of her eyes. It scraped the side of her face instead drawing a thin scrawl of blood from her left cheek, the breeze in her face as she ran, tearing through a thicket with a crackling sound that seemed very ow. Not very ow. That seemed very distant. She was unaware of the thorns which ripped at her jeans and tore shallow gouges in her arms. 
was cool and strangely exhilarating. She pelted up a slope, now running full out with her hat on crooked and her hair flying behind her. The rubber band which held it in a ponytail was long since lost. Hurtling small trees which had fallen, which had fallen in some long ago storm, topping a ridge, and suddenly there was a long blue-gray valley spread out before her with brazen granite cliffs rising on the far side, miles from where she was, and directly in front of her, nothing but a gray shimmer of early summer air through which she would fall to her death, turning over and over and screaming for her mother. Too bad I wasn't at the, like, at the crest of a hill. <laughs> Her mind was gone again, lost in that white, no-brain roar of terror, but her body recognized that stopping in time to avoid going over the cliff edge was an impossibility. All she could was a trip. All she could hope to do was redirect her motion before it was too late. Trisha swerved to the left, and as she did, her right foot kicked out over the drop. She could hear the pebbles dislodged by that foot rattling down the ancient rock wall in a little stream. Trisha bolted along the strip where the needle-coated needle -coated floor of the forest gave way to the bald rock making the edge of the cliff. She ran with some confused and roaring knowledge of what had almost happened to her and also some vague memory of a science fiction movie in which the hero had lured a rampaging, rampaging dinosaur into running over a cliff to its death. Or what's that movie with Kevin Bacon and the wormy thingies? Uh, Tremors. <laughs> they did that in Tremors. Ahead, ahead of her an ash tree had fallen with its final 20 feet jutting over the drop, like the prow of a ship. Trisha grabbed it with both arms and hugged it, her scraped and bloody cheek jammed against the smooth trunk, each breath whistling into her with a shriek and emerging in a terrified sob. She stood that way for a long time shuddering all over and embracing the tree. At last, she opened her eyes. Her head was turned to the right, and she was looking down before she could stop herself. At this point, the cliff's drop was only 50 feet, ending in a pile of glacial splintery rubble that sprouted little clumps of bright green bushes. There was a heap of rotting trees and branches as well, dead wood blown over the cliff's edge in some long ago storm. An image came to Trisha then, one that was terrible in its utter clarity. She, she saw herself falling toward that jack straw pile, screaming and waving her arms as she went down. Saw a dead branch punching through the under shelf of her jaw and up between her teeth attacking her tongue to the roof of her mouth like a red memo, then spearing into her brain and killing her. Oh, okay. <laughs> Again, she screams, but especially <laughs> when I'm in the woods, <laughs> I'm not going to scream. No! She screamed both revolted by the image and terrified by its possibility. She caught her breath. <sighs> I'm not for me to catch my breath. I apparently can't walk and read at the same time without being winded. <sighs> so pathetic. I'm all right, she said, speaking low and fast. The bramble scratches on her arms and the scrape on her cheek throbbed and stung with sweat. She was just now becoming aware of these little hurts. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm okay. Here, baby. She let go of the ash tree, 
weight on her feet and then clutched it again as panic lunged inside her head. An irrational part of her actually expected the ground to tilt and spilt her off the edge. I'm okay, she said, still low and fast. She licked her upper lip and tasted damp salt. I'm okay, I'm okay. She repeated it over and over, but it was still three minutes before she could persuade her arms to loosen their death clutch on the ash tree a second time. When she finally managed it, Trisha stepped back away from the drop. She reset her cap, turning it around so the bell pointed backward without even thinking about it, and looked out across the valley. She saw the sky, now sagging with rain clouds, and she saw roughly six trillion trees, but she saw no sign of human life, not even smoke from a single campfire. I'm all right, though. I'm okay. She took another step back from the drop and uttered a little scream as something snakes, snakes brushed the backs of her brushed the backs of her knees. Just bushes, of course. More checker more checkerberry bushes. The woods were full of them. Yuck yuck. And the bugs had found her again. They were reforming their cloud. Hundreds of tiny black dots dancing around her eyes. Only that this time the spots were bigger and seemed to be bursting open like the blooms of black roses. Trisha had time enough to think, I'm fainting. This is fainting. And then she went down on her back in the bushes. Her eyes rolled up to whites, the bugs hanging in a shimmering cloud above her small pallid face. After a moment or two, the first mosquitoes alit on her eyelids and began to feed. I'm going home now. <laughs> I will talk to you later. Maybe see you later. Maybe talk to you. I don't know. <laughs> kind of like this. This was fun. Aggravating a little bit, but fun. Okay, bye.